Hi everyone, welcome to our session today. We're going to talk about how to prepare your data and targeted messaging for the holiday push. And it's brought to you by Fresh Address and DMI Partners. I'm Jennifer Soros, the marketing assistant here at Fresh Address. And before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few items. We are muting the lines today for this session. And please put any questions you might have throughout the session in the chat. April and Zach will answer them at the end. The session is also being recorded and we will be emailing the recording and PDF in a follow-up email. And to get started, let's meet our speakers. We have April Page, the marketing manager at Fresh Address and Zach Labenberg, VP of Client Strategies at DMI Partners. And now I'm going to hand it over to April. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. So um, those of you who aren't familiar with Fresh Address, I'm just going to go through briefly what we're about. Uh, we're the experts in data and email validation since 1999. We clean, protect, and grow your email databases, which helps our clients avoid email delivery issues and in turn increases your revenues and ROIs. So you all work so hard to collect your customer email data, and we're here to help you protect that data. And FA works with many large world brands, Fortune 100 companies, small, medium, and large businesses, as well as partnerships with ESPs. And what sets us apart uh, really from all the others is our best-in-class technology, our proprietary intellectual products, our dedicated data research team, which a lot of companies don't have, and our extensive databases that deliver unparalleled intelligence and results. And I know this firsthand because I used to be a fresh address client. And a little bit about DMI partners, if you're not familiar with them, they are a full service digital marketing agency. They excel in award-winning campaigns for recognized consumer B2B and e-commerce brands since 2003. And what sets them apart is they have innovative email and affiliate management solutions that accompany an arsenal of digital services, which include SEO, paid search, e-commerce, branding, social media, advanced marketing analytics. And it's all designed to engage your target audiences and drive your revenue. And they're staffed by big agency talent, but they offer the personal attention and agility of a boutique, excuse me, and that's really where they shine, in, in my opinion. So what are we going to talk to you about today? So if you haven't heard uh, about the iOS 15 coming for Apple, I'm sure most of you have, or at least uh, talked about it with someone. Um, that's happening any minute now, and we're going to talk to you about what it means to your data. And then we're going to go into how important it is to prep your data for the holiday season and give you some examples of your data flow and after that data is prepped we're going to go into how important it is for messaging and segmentation to go along with that it has to be on point so you have successful campaigns and we're going to show you some examples there as well so we're going to go through some key takeaways in the wrap-up and then zach and i are going to take any questions that you might have so i'm going to turn it over to zach to get us started zach Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and just to dive into a little of the background on iOS 15, I'm sure um, I'm not, you know, introducing a new concept to anyone on this call. This has really been like a um, uh, an update that's been um, reverberating throughout the email industry for the past few months. And timely enough, it seems like we're about a week away now. Um, all signs are pointing to um, the 20th uh, for um, initial update and then um, rapid adoption. So. You know, what this means, this is all just another step in what's been a pretty rapid uh, development and progress on the data protection front. So, you know, going back just two years ago, uh, we started to see um, the really big pushes for, um, you know, cookie blocking. Um, we saw CCPA go into effect. Uh, but, you know, fast forwarding to this June when the specifics of the mail protection um, portion of iOS 15 became uh, readily, readily known that this was definitely the biggest update that most directly and acutely is um, affecting email marketers. Uh, so we kind of you know jumped into action to learn as much as we could and and 
gather as much information as we could, both from um, our brands uh, that had uh, email campaigns that we were helping with, uh, from email service providers, from data partners, really from anyone who was kind of like learning about it from all different perspectives to see, you know, what they thought it was going to affect and what they were doing to prep uh, so we could kind of form a good, um, com lo you know, lowest common denominator assumption for all of our clients. It, that picture is very clear now. Um, but it's, it's something that the more you've been able to prep for and the more you continue to prep for, the better position you'll be in post-update. Um, so, you know, just a quick summary of what we see as the updates. And again, I, I'd imagine a lot of this will be just kind of um, refresher for um, most everyone on the call. But, you know, to the left, you see kind of a rendering of what we're expecting, the mail privacy protection um, uh, update, uh, mail privacy protection feature to look like it that you'll get prompted with uh, when you do the iOS 15 update. As you can see, you know, very leading towards a yes similar to what we've seen with other um, opt-out of tracking updates that have come along with um, Apple updates in the past. Um, and effectively, you know, we're, we're assuming near 100% um, adoption of uh, this, just given the way we're anticipating it being presented to consumers. And there's kind of three big things that we're um, level setting with our clients on prepping for. You know, one is this will give consumers the opportunity and the ability to block their IP address. You know, I think there's a lot of ways in which we can all envision how that could affect some of our current um, email campaign triggers, but, you know, by and large, one of the big concerns our clients had was, you know, geotargeting and, and things like that. And honestly, a lot of our clients are leveraging other first party data pieces to help with that. So, you know, the ability to block your IP address is definitely going to create a lot of hurdles, but we, we don't see that as something that um, we won't be able to overcome in a way that allows them to still send meaningful, effective email campaigns. Um, you know, the same goes for the second, the ability to hide your email address. Um, we have seen this um, feature rolled out with other uh, email providers in the past and um, adoption is and adoption utilization is a bit um, lower. I think the people who use it will use it um, effectively and it'll be more difficult to um, market to them the way that you have historically, but we, we don't envision this being something that's like, going to affect the masses of our client email databases. It's really this third one that's like the game changer, the ability to turn off open pixel tracking. You know, so effectively what that means is you guys all uh, probably know, you know, the way opens have historically been tracked by the service providers is, you know, that small image pixel that downloads when an email is opened and the images are called uh, with the privacy protection update. We're going to see that Apple is pre-downloading those images on proxy servers, um, and which in, in effect is going to make it look like, um, if, no, if no other tracking changes, that's going to make it look like all of those emails were open just based on the fact that they were del delivered to an uh, Apple Mail endpoint. So, you know, how widespread is this effect going to be? I think, you know, not surprisingly pretty widespread. I, you know, Apple devices have become more and more commonplace in the consumer marketplace. Um, you know, we've seen estimates uh, as high as, as you see here, like 93 plus percent of email opens on mobile devices coming from Apple mail apps um, and, you know, potentially well over 50% of total opens um, or total emails delivered. Um, this does vary a lot client to client. So, you know, a lot of this won't, the specific effects on each of our clients and on each of your campaigns won't be known until this goes into effect because you know, the average age of the database and uh, other factors will, um, you know, skew this. But we're definitely prepping our clients for an expectation that uh, a very large percentage of the total emails that are being sent are going to look like they are opened, whether or not they actually were opened, um, which is going to, you know, make it very difficult for um, open based metrics to be. Uh, helpful or utilized kind of in any meaningful way. So that's the big scenario that we're helping all of our clients prep for. In terms of what we should do now or what we should have been doing, you know, really as soon as June, we started getting our clients into a place where they started prepping uh, new benchmarks. So, you know, this is kind of the buzz phrase that we've been heard thrown around by everyone who's trying to be a, kind of a thought leader in this space is, you know, it's, it's long past time to move past opens as a primary KPI. There's way more meaningful metrics we can be looking at to gauge uh, the success of email programs. Um, and while there's truth to that, you know, opens still were really helpful, I think, in a lot of our clients' campaign triggers, which we'll get to at a later date. But the reality is we can't rely on them in the same way we have. You know, um, we need to define baseline click rates, um, build some relational data as much as we can between clicks and opens while we have rely on reliable open data. Um, and really move towards a world where, at a minimum, we're looking at clicks and, and other metrics, as we'll get into. Um, you know, we did want our clients, and, and I would say this is still true, even though there's only a week left, to really leverage the open data they have now to learn as much as they can about their existing segments. You know, the, the more you can do now to uh, define who your loyal openers are, your moderate openers are, you know, who's at risk of becoming stagnant, who's a defined non-opener, 
Uh, and the more you can kind of have those segments defined now based on the abundance of data you've had up until this point, um, it's definitely going to help you in the future state when you're, you know, if you, if you do have to do any sort of deliverability repair or um, uh, things like that. So definitely encourage our clients over the past few months and, and again, continue to do so to do what they can to learn as much as they can about the existing subscribers who have a lot of engagement activity. Um, but moving forward, you know, look to build future segmentation on other engagement indicators. Clicks, again, being kind of the next step down the funnel, but things like forwards. Um, we have clients who, you know, will still um, push out uh, elements that would require a print or sort in like on-site activity, uh, like a download or a click out to a retail partner. You know, again, you want to get as creative as possible here. Anything you can do that like allows you to measure some sort of heightened engagement from a subscriber um, and, you know, create um, rules that segment consumers based on that is really going to put you in a position to succeed um, in the future. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to kick it back to April to talk to us a bit about what we can be doing on the uh, data side to, you know, prepare for this change in the holiday season. Yep. Thanks, Zach. So as you guys can see, prepping your data is more important than it ever was. And uh, as a marketer, what do you need to keep your eye on? So I wanted to um, go through a few key trends that were saying, you know, there's more emails than ever that are being created. You know, co with COVID, there are many inactive and new emails due to employment and change in, of employment. So um, there's other reasons as well, but that's on the rise. There's 30% yearly change in email addresses on the regular. Um, the email spend is increasing for obvious reasons. You know, there's less in-person contact, so we need to stay in front of our prospects and clients. Um, and the email deliverability, you know, usually there's a 20% or more failure rate there. And it's not just the undeliverable addresses you need to worry about. It's the deliverables as well. And towards the bottom, we've listed some out. Uh, there's malicious addresses, roll accounts, spam complainers, et cetera. And these affect your company's sender reputation. Every company has a sender reputation and you need to, if you're not already aware, know what yours is. And eventually, if your reputation is bad enough, you can get shut down from all your campaigns, including transactional emails to your customers if you don't have a good email hygiene process in place. So um, how can we help? The good news is Fresh Address has a product called Safe to Send. And that Safe to Send solution is email validation, but it goes beyond that. It goes to check, correct, and protect your data. It checks that your emails are valid. It also corrects any typos with our patented technology. It, it protects your data from removing any known spam traps as well and possible deliverable but problematic scenarios that we just talked about. So we have a, a data research team that is regularly updating that information for our customers. And not a lot of companies have that. Uh, in their arsenal. And I wanted to show you guys this very um, simple uh, diagram just to give you an example of what uh, you might do to stop bad data from entering your database. So the data is collected from a point of collection. So it could be a point of sale, a website, a call center, something entered incorrectly as a human being, right? You see the failure rates there. But FA can provide a safe to send plus, which is a line of code that will flag the information as it's entered. You know, it's connected to our API. Here's what it looks like. I think we've all experienced this in our life. Um, we've had a flagged email come up as we're entering it. And that's someone who has a validation hygiene um, service connected to where the data is being entered. So it's not transferred into the database and they don't have to clean it up later. So this is just a bad address. And of course, you know, with the code, it just asks the user to enter it again. I wanted to show you a, um, a more extensive infographic. I've just recently created this email hygiene process just to uh, not make things complicated, but to show you what yours might look like. Um, this is really a way to kind of diagram out um, where your your steps might be in collecting data 
and then where your company is putting the information and what the hierarchy might be for that information. So you have to map it out internally, right? It's worth um, taking the effort to have the right conversations with different departments to do that. So um, it will be ben beneficial, I assure you, to everyone um, that's involved to know where the data is coming from, how it's flowing, how you're cleaning it, and what you're doing with all of that information that you gain from the hygiene process. So after you have your deliverability taken care of, we have kind of the next level set of solutions that will assist you even more to make sure your data is ready. And that's email change of address, which is also known as ECOA. It provides emails for bounces and inactives that come through from the hygiene process. Uh, we also have the B2B and B2C email append that provides emails you don't have in your database currently. You never had them. And then the name and postal append, which is obvious, you know, you provide, we provide the name um, and postal data from your emails if you don't have that. So just to kind of go through, I'm not going to go through every step, but just to give you an idea of what ECOA looks like, you know, we take your bounces and inactive emails. And we go through and we find a new current email for that person. And right now we have just announced a new auto ECOA solution, which allows you to update your files immediately. Um, you can kind of get rid of those last two steps, the opt-in and the, the cleanse. Um, you can do the opt-in yourself. Uh, and then B2C and B2B, pretty obvious. We match the data. Um, append to your email addresses so or i'm sorry to your your customer data and we use postal records to find that email and again we have a, a new product that is auto append that will allow you to get that information even faster if you want to do the opt-in process yourself um, then lastly is name and postal pretty obvious but you know, the reason some of the companies that work with us try to get postal records is not just for marketing, you know, to send um, sales information or coupons, et cetera, but it's also for invoices and account information and things that are um, highly sensitive that they need to have uh, in paper. So um, something to think about as kind of the next level of your uh, data process. You know, my my um, solution is really you, you need to map this out and then um, be able to talk with one of our experts to help you figure out what your next steps might be. So I'm gonna turn this over uh, to Zach. So once your, your data is sorted, you know, basically you have to get your messaging and segmentation um, you know, on point. Uh, the, the right person needs the right email, right? So Zach's gonna talk to us about that. Absolutely. And it really is, again, I mean, the reason all of the data prep work and, and even preparing for the iOS change are so important is because you know, we all put so much work into email messaging strategy. Uh, and these, you know, ongoing email campaigns really are one of the best downstream performers to continue driving purchases and, and website engagement um, for our clients' databases. Um, and you spend all that time uh, creating those campaigns, um, including things like post-purchase and cart abandon. Um, and you want to make sure that you're in a position to actually able to deliver those emails and measure the engagement and segment the consumers based on um, you know, how they're how they're engaging with those campaigns. Um, so it all starts with design. We want to make sure that we're designing emails that are like compelling and interesting and drive engagement and conversions. Uh, but we don't want to like sit still once we have those in place. We want to be continuously testi testing and optimizing at each step in the process. We really view this all as like a giant machine with a bunch of moving pieces, and we want to constantly be improving every piece of the machine to increase. Um, engagement rates, retention rates, conversion rates, uh, send volume, basically every KPI that can be attributed to the success of each component of like every campaign within your email program. We want to be constantly A-B testing every single one, um, deciding on winners and making improvements and moving forwards. Um, and then it really is, you know, with segmentation, we really are talking about a two-way street. You know, we want to leverage um, engagement and conversion data uh, with these email campaigns to improve our segments, better define who are the most highly engaged subscribers, most prone to convert, the people who want to be receiving more emails um, more often. Um, and then we want to take that learning from the segmentation to deliver more relevant personalized messages to each um, segment and, and sub-segment within each 
message. I think one of our, you know, one of the biggest surprises a lot of our clients will have is just how much more email they can be sending to the most highly engaged segment of their database if they can reach a point where they have segmented, you know, the top 5% of engagers or converters. Um, they can be sending so much more email to those, uh, to that top segment than they would ever want to send to the full 100% or even the bottom 90%. Uh, but if you do the hard work of constantly testing to elevate that segment, um, it's amazing how much additional revenue you can pick up um, just by the additional sending you can do to those top segments and the, you know, the enhances you see in um, engagement and deliverability long term by not oversending to the, uh, the lower segments. Um, you know, one kind of basic visual representation we really like to share during these conversations with our clients is you know, a really simple explanation of what we're trying to achieve with email optimization. And when we, when we talk about personalization, kind of the long struggle of moving towards uh, hyper-personalized email experiences for every subscriber in our client's databases. You know, so what you'll see on the left is what we would describe as like a traditional journey. You know, a, a subscriber comes, uh, comes in, uh, maybe they get a welcome series, but then everyone kind of gets in the same general cadence. You know, we're kind of past the days of seeing people doing just like total batch and blast, but it seems like every, a lot of our clients still are on a, in a position where the vast majority, the largest segment of the database is kind of all getting emails on the same cadence. Um, and what we want to do is build personalized journeys by doing a ton of A-B tests um, and, and personalization triggers at kind of every step. So that's what's represented in that middle section. And then at scale, what that looks like is, you know, in a, per, in a perfect world where we've done as many optimizations as possible, you know, no two subscribers in your database are having the exact same experience in terms of the type of email, the frequency of email, the time of day, um, you know, because you're going to have learned and created triggers that allow you to send the right message to the right consumer at the right frequency um, based on, on these things. And, you know, to go back quickly to the iOS update, I would say, you know, 60, 70% plus of our clients as of now are using opens as the primary um, uh, trigger to determine, you know, which uh, path a consumer should be going down during one of these uh, journeys. So that's like one of the big effects is, you know, what are we using as that trigger moving forward if it's not going to be an open, uh, or if we can't rely entirely on, you know, known opens as a um, as a trigger for creating a more personalized experience. Um, just to give some examples here, one to showcase the fact that I think we do really good work designing emails for clients, but also to speak more generally about the fact that like emails are much more visually appealing than they were a year ago, certainly than they were five or 10 years ago, um, you know, be, because, you know, it's become something that's like one of the first things you're checking on your iPhone, the, the landscape and real estate on your phone has become much more um, adept to, you know, creating visually appealing email experiences that look and feel like a lot of other things that you're doing on your phone, which is kind of your primary um, media viewpoint these days. So you can design a lot of these great emails, and you know this kind of goes back to our previous point where like if we can define who the top engaged subscribers on the database who want to be receiving an email potentially every day or multiple times a day during q4 if you've got enough promotions and reasons to be sending you want to be sending to those people as many times as possible to get these um images and uh promotions in front of them but you also don't want to oversend to the lower portions of your database that could get you into a position where you start to see unsubscribes or complaints or um, you know, worst case scenario, any sort of deliverability issues that limit your ability to actually get the messages to the people who do want to be seeing them more regularly. Um, so just a quick wrap up on everything we've walked through here before we dive into some questions. You know, on the iOS 15 front, what does it mean? Emails that are getting delivered to Apple Mail endpoints, you know, Apple Mail, iPhone Mail, iPad Mail. Um, the, oh, it, in all likelihood, we're going to see open rates <clears throat> dramatically increase. Um, overnight based on the way we're envisioning most email service pro providers reporting out of the gate here because as the image, emails get delivered, the images are going to be pre-download. It'll look like all of those open pixels fired. Uh, so all of your kind of uh, engagement KPIs and triggers that are tied to positively known opens um, are going to become, if not obsolete, you know, certainly much less effective. Uh, so we would definitely want to define baseline click rates for our clients. Um, we want to um, continue to build engagement segments that are going to be crucial for long-term deliverability. I think that's you know, one of the biggest concerns we have for our clients is making sure um, that they have uh, segments uh, based on engagement value of their subscribers um, ready for a deliverability issue that could come tomorrow. Uh, they know who the people are that are most likely to open um, if they were to kind of start to rebuild that reputation. Um, we also obviously need to do a really big focus on uh, prepping your data ahead of this. Um, you know, determining the email data flow internal hierarchy is, is obviously essential as April is explaining. 
uh, we've got to make sure you have an email hygiene uh, process in place that it removes invalids before you start sending. Uh, that's going to be even more important in the future state where you can't leverage something like an open as an indicator that a subscriber is uh, good or an early engager in your flow. And certainly, you know, consider some of these enhanced uh, products that can add a lot of value to the existing database. I know, you know, we can speak from experience. We've had clients leverage the uh, email change, change of address tool. And especially as we look at like long-term migrations from Yahoo to Gmail as people's primary addresses, it's been really helpful in our clients um, getting back into kind of primary inboxes and viewpoints with their subscribers. And then from a messaging and segmentation standpoint, just to kind of wrap up where we see the biggest iOS 15 impact, um, there's kind of three buckets we think about it. First is on the acquisition front. Um, you know, opener rates have been historically one of our strongest early indicators of uh, new subscriber quality. Uh, so, you know, if a, every day that passes that a new subscriber that joins your list doesn't open their first email, it becomes less likely they're ever going to open. So it was a great way to differentiate higher value early subscribers from lower value early subscribers, and very importantly, to stop sending to people who aren't opening and, and aren't as interested. Um, so, you know, that's definitely an area where we want to be able to focus on click KPIs and establish other KPIs to help measure the value of new subscribers that you're acquiring. Um, personalization, as I mentioned, we're going to need to, to transition away from open-based triggers to uh, other actions, and then segmentation as well. Uh, really, really, really important to make sure that we're uh, getting a good handle on the different um, engaged uh, segments within your database so you kind of know what you can rely on in the future state. Thank you, April and Zach, for some great information. We're now going to take a few questions. As a reminder, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat at this time. April and Zach, I do have your first question that came through. What are your clients anticipating the biggest long-term challenge for email marketing will be as a result of iOS 15? Um, I can hop in uh, and grab this sure. one. Sure, the, sure. you know, the, the conversation we're having most frequently with our clients that kind of gets them shaking a little bit and has us doing the most prep work for the future is preventing future deliverability issues and then how to repair those deliverability issues. Um, so much of that has relied historically on opens and it's really one of the cruel uh, ironies of this update is so many of our clients have told us, you know, one of the most important things we use the open for is to know when to stop sending subscribers emails. Uh, and we're not gonna be able to do that anymore. Almost all of our clients have some sort of like churn or inactivity rate where if a subscriber hasn't opened in the past 30 or 90 days, they stop sending emails to them. And, and uh, you know, that's important because they don't wanna be inundating people's inboxes and sending more than they need to. Um, but that logic won't work in the future, uh, at least not reliably or nearly as effectively. So, you know, that leaves you prone to diminishing engagement results. It also leaves you prone to deliverability issues. Um, you know, one thing I've talked about um, with April as it relates to kind of uh, both of our solutions is, you know, one of the reasons I think our clients avoid some email landmines right now, especially things like spam traps and um, honeypots and things like that is they stop sending to addresses when they become inactive. So they never know that that could be a troublesome address in the future. But if the logic they're using for that now is an open, uh, they're going to be really vulnerable. That's going to be a blind spot. They might continue sending to someone who they would have lapsed in the past, uh, but now that they don't. So it kind of really adds to April's uh, point earlier that you need to be doing a lot more enhanced and proactive validation and hygiene work. Great. Jen, we have any other questions? We do. Um, do you see advertisers sending more frequent emails during the Q4 season? Yeah, I can hop in here and provide some perspective too. I think, you know, generally, yes, that's probably not surprising to a lot of the, the people on this call, but I think the way that we see it done most effectively is sending more emails to the people who want to be receiving more emails um, and proportionally more. So certainly, I think most segments within our client databases receive more emails in Q4 when especially they're doing promotional things that are going to be more likely to drive a conversion that, than at other points in the year. But again, the more frequent and timely emails you can be sending to the people who want to be receiving them more, um, and then the, the better you can kind of waterfall down from that top segment to people who maybe you don't, you know, all the way at the bottom that you don't need to be sending more often, more frequently to. Uh, the better off you are. So in the aggregate, for sure, we see, we see sending go up, uh, but it's best done when it's done smartly and proportionally. And I have a couple that uh, just came through. Do you expect personalization and segmentation to become more important with the iOS update? 
And if so, does it become harder to do the segmentation and personalization without reliable opener data? Good question. Uh, Zach? Yeah, I would say it's a yes to both. It's more important and it's more difficult. Um, and one of the reasons it's more important is because it's more difficult. It's, it's always been an essential part of our clients' programs to be good at segmentation and to be good at personalization. Um, but so much of those building blocks that have allowed them to get to the place they're at uh, have been based on opener-based metrics, which are, again are going to be far less effective, if not uh, totally ineffective in the future. So, it's, yeah. but they're going to continue to be important. And I think, um, Zach, just to add, I think time campaigns are going to be affected as well, right? Yeah. Like campaigns definitely. based on on timing of opens, so it triggers, you know, the next email. If it's, you know, timing in a sequence, then that's. If, if in the new iOS, it's my understanding we're not going to know the timing. Exactly. Yes, that's a, another essential piece that's going to make personalization, especially. Again, it's almost all of those personalization triggers that I was referencing earlier right now are tied to opener-based activity, um, and and the other, even the ones that aren't. Um, that's certainly where you get the most volume. Obviously, like that's one thing I kind of neglected to mention earlier. That's an obvious reality of this is like moving from openers to clicks. Sounds easy yeah. enough, but there's like a huge trade-off in volume. You know, a 20% right. open rate probably has a 2% click rate. So you're looking at like a much smaller pool of data to be making personalization decisions off of. Yep. Jen, do we have anything else? Thanks, Zach. Yeah, we have the last question. Um, is there a thought as to how a good sender will be judged by ISPs? How does iOS 15 change the criteria there? And any immediate word from Gmail, Microsoft, on if they'll continue using opens to judge who lands in the spam and who doesn't? Uh, well, I think um, they might segment that out. The word on the street, anyway, is what I've been hearing, is they might be segmenting, you know, uh, Apple data from yeah, everything else. Um, Zach, I don't know if you have uh, any insight there. I've heard similar things. I will also say that, like, I a lot of the perspective we've heard that's skewed in that direction kind of sounds like wishful thinking. Not that it won't come true, but I just don't know how we can know for sure until the update happens and we kind of see in practice what a lot of that data looks like. There, there certainly will be workarounds. And I think some of the scenarios you just laid out, April, will, will likely become the case. But I, I definitely think that's like one of the very big wait and see components um, yeah. of what is, is going to happen. And your sender reputation, I mean, if they're all opens, then it's gonna, going to um, be fantastic, but you're not going to have any real data, right? So, yep. yeah, I don't, uh, hopefully that answered that question for that person, but we don't, we don't have enough information still to, uh, we'd only be guessing. So we, we really are trying to wait till it launches. We've been playing around with the beta um, tests with that, but uh, we're not sure if that's what's actually going to be rolled out either. Jen, are we good? Yeah, and I think that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, okay. April, April and Zach's contact information is on the screen in case you'd like to contact them directly or if you have any further questions. Again, we will follow up with a recording and PDF of this session in an email. Thanks everyone for your time today and have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.